Yeah, great. Hi, Victoria. Great to see you. Hello. Thank you so much for coming uh, this evening. I'm just just making sure we're getting into the room and and giving. Oh, here we go. I'm just making sure that people have the chance to um to kind of get into the space uh, before we start going with things. And uh and it's a real um it's a real joy to have you in. We've talked about it a few times, and obviously it's difficult sometimes getting getting schedules together. But um especially at the moment because I know you're going through uh something personally with the family at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I was actually supposed to be doing this um, from the United States, so it'd be nice and light outside where I am now, but unfortunately my mother has um, been very ill and is in hospital, so I came over emergency yesterday, and um, so I'm in her study, I don't usually have pictures like this behind me, but this is my mum's study where she likes to put pictures of all the family and the grandkids and me and my sister everywhere so that's the backdrop I have to explain that but she's all right she's o- she's okay she's okay well I say even more reason to kind of thank you for kind of offering your time to talk to us tonight and um uh and it's nice right moms if, if moms can't have pictures of us pictures of us on our wall who can right I think that's the that's the thing I'm sure she's very proud of you and as she should be of course before we kind of dive in you know we're just chatting very quickly off air before we came in and hi everybody by the way hi emma hi kim hi gabriel hi laura hi Lord. brilliant and those people yeah oh my god the room's filling up big time hi everybody welcome sorry we're a couple minutes behind um uh i want to share with people a little bit about our our own little journey together really because it, we go back away victoria i have to say i was thinking actually it's what it was the same year that i met my husband because uh, you were the reason I got took away from my husband in the early days, bless him. But it did give me the first opportunity to buy him some flowers while I wasn't there. How about that? So anyway, I came up to the dog. Uh, it was the bike conference back then. And it was all in person, of course. This is way before any thoughts of pandemics yeah. and stuff. And uh, I remember queuing up with everybody else to have a little chat with Victoria, as you do, on the break. And uh, I was struggling down here at the time because I, I was in an environment, local environment, where it was a lot of balanced trainers. And there was a particular trainer who was making life a bit difficult for me. And you probably don't remember the conversation directly, but uh, but your words then kept me going. So I think if I hadn't have come to that conference about you, I might not even be doing the job. So that's one huge thing. But I also got a chance to listen to Sarah Fisher then. I thought, this is really interesting because this is a little bit different. And uh, and something that I was kind of very interested in thinking about the more. Then, of course, we got together through the charter. We've come on to the charter in a little bit and we got a chance to meet each other. Uh, and uh, then I got a chance. You very kindly invited me on to speak on your on your podcast to talk about the charter and then I just happened to mention a few things about thinking about things a little bit about the individual emotional experience and uh that seemed to get on really well so I came back on over the chat and that's when you invited me to speak at the online behavioral conference which I did a, a couple of years ago and it was because of that because I'm, I'm I kind of just do my own thing really I thought my god I'm doing this big thing it's a huge opportunity that Victoria's offered me and a great kind of vote of confidence really a bit of a leap of faith I thought well I haven't got anything else to kind of show so I need to do something so I thought I know I'll set up a Facebook group and I might get a few couple of hundred people to come along Mm -hmm. and that is folks the evolution of dog-centered care right because it just wouldn't be here Victoria so so this is I think I just wanted to mention that because I think it's really important because there's a direct relation to our relationship and this group which is now getting on for 10,000. Amazing. That's my husband. I hope he's just come back. Uh, he's got to uh, get off for 10,000 people. So I think people are interested in this stuff. So we're going to come back to that as well in a little bit as well, because there's elements of the stuff that you've done and, and educated about, which is really relevant to the things we talk about in this group. But let's just kind of pedal back a little bit, right? Uh, for somebody who looks so fabulous, Victoria, you have been around a bit. Uh, you've yeah. been around for a little while now. What are you saying? Uh, I know what I'm saying, uh, but I it have. feels like yesterday. Uh-huh. I know, but I think that's important because there's a lot of stuff. You know, I've got to know you uh, relatively well, and and I I see us as having a bit of a friendship now, uh, more than just a kind of a kind of professional side of things. And uh, it's tough, I think, when you end up having a career that's very much in the spotlight, and especially one that spreads over a period of time. And a lot of stuff gets said, and a lot of things I read, I think, God, you just don't know, Victoria. You don't know the story. So I want to start off really by giving an opportunity for people to hear direct from source, really, um, about your own passions and how your own story has developed through. So start wherever you want to and take it however you want to take it. Um, Wow, okay. Um, Right. 
I'll be try and be succinct, but from the age of six, I wanted to be an actor. And so I pursued that really through university. And after going to drama school, I went to a drama school, which is called, was called Weber Douglas. It's now um, converged uh, with Central School of Speech and Drama, but it was a tough school to get into. So after university, I went there and then I start, I worked in the industry for many years. But as an actor, you always have to have another string to your bow. And my other passion was dogs. And um, my grandmother bred beagles and she's a hobby breeder, but very responsible breeder. And so when I went to go to uh, visit her, which was all the time, we spent a lot of time with my grandmother growing up, my sister and I. And so uh, she lived in the converted stables of this old Cistercian Abbey that's on the banks of the River Thames in a little town, little village, I should say, called Medmenham. And there would be puppies and puppies and fabulous beagles, and she would keep quite a few of them. And so I just, I, I was... I was the happiest when I was there. Um, anyway, so between university and drama school, I started a dog walking business because after university, I was like, I don't really know what to do now. I have a degree, but I need to go to drama school really in order to become a great actor. So I needed money for that. And I started off a dog walking company in Wimbledon Common. And I started off, I, I remember I started off with one dog. And at the end of the month, I had 20. I had 10 in the morning and 10 in the afternoon. Now bear in mind, 10 walked all at the same time. And of course, this is very topical right now. Mm -hmm. But back then, which was like 30 years ago, a bit, quite, quite a few years ago, I should say, um, it we can say we can just say pre, like, we can say pre COVID now just pre COVID, -COVID. Yeah. everyone knows what I mean yeah. and uh, yeah you're right and it was really through that I would walk ten in the morning and ten in the afternoon by the way I wasn't the only dog walker on the common there was one that man that walked twenty five at a time but um, I would pick up the dogs put them in my car drive up to the common let them all out we go for a great one and a half hour to two hour walk come back put the dogs in the car and they were all they loved me they were all off the lead they never ran away they never fought and we walked in areas where we never saw anybody else I had no idea what I was doing but I loved it and I know that the dogs were happier because of it and one day I did meet somebody who was like, I watched you with these dogs. And he was a dog trainer. And that was it. And, and he was like, would you, do you want to learn more about what you're doing? And I was like, well, I do, because actually I really don't have a clue. I just love what I'm doing. And so he was my sort of my first introduction into this world. Now he, I would say class him as more of a balanced trainer. But um, again, that kind of verbiage wasn't used then. And um, so I learned. And then I became really into learning from people like Jan Fennell. And, um, you know, Ian Dunbar, big, huge into Ian Dunbar. So I would start reading and I would start researching. But at that time, there really wasn't a place for me to go learn just to be a dog trainer. You could go to university, do animal behavior, but I didn't want to do that. I just wanted to learn the art of dog training. So I was self-taught. And it wasn't until I took my training company to the to New York that I became certified. I had to in order to work in Petco, which is one of the biggest um, the stores over in the United States. I think there were about a thousand of them. But in order to become a Petco trainer, you have to be certified. You have to go through a whole set of exams. And that's what I did. So I was certified and I started a company in New York City called Dog Trainers of New York. And then another one called Dog Trainers of New Jersey. And this was all before It's Me or the Dog. So we're gearing up for It's Me or the Dog. But I also did a lot of rescue. And Saturday and Sunday, I'd moved by that time to New York City. My husband's American. He had an apartment in New York. So we moved over there. I met him in England, but we moved over to New York City. I was still acting at the time as well, but I just would feel, I'd feel a bit there when I came back from a casting or an audition. But then I would go to do a dog training and I would come back feeling amazing. And I was like, you know what? Somebody's trying to tell me something here. So that's when I went full time. 
but Saturdays and Sundays sat outside on Amsterdam Avenue, I think it was 81st Street, with a company called Cause for Cause, uh, a charity organization where we would get animals out of animal care and control in New York City to get them adopted, dogs and cats. So my house, our little tiny 450 square foot apartment was full of fosters. I mean, we had <laughs> everything from pit bulls to German shepherds, not all at the same time. We had kittens, we had shih tzus. We, I mean, we had everything, puppies, all elderly dogs, everything. I think we had 40 in the two years that we were living there. And the, the devastating thing about that whole place was that in Manhattan and the five boroughs, the the rate the kill rate was massive and i it 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 caused me so much anxiety as well as all the other people that i was working with i have to say people don't know it but i work with natalie portman because natalie portman is a huge animal rescuer right so she's like that was her thing so she also volunteered for cause for pause so mm. it was really she was actually much younger at the time um but anyway that was a name drop there, but I thought, how cool of that, because she was quite getting to be quite well known, even when she was, because she was, when she was very young. But anyway, Natalie and I would sit there trying to get people to adopt these dogs and cats. And then I came up with an idea of the show. I was so mad. I was like, there's got to be a better way to get the message out there that if your dog has a behavior problem or some issue, there is something you can do it down. And so um, I had my daughter by then. I'd moved to New Jersey, had my daughter by then. I'm sorry, I think my internet connection is a bit unstable if I get a bit, you know, in and out. But, um, and I put it to bed. And I watched the first episode of The Super Nanny. And I was like, oh, my God, that's it. I do that with dogs. So I got who the producers were. I ran down to my computer. I was shaking like a leaf because I was like, this is it. And I emailed the producers. I said, I've got a great idea for a new show. And the next day, they called me. In a couple of months' time, um, they, they asked me to put a video together. So I found the craziest family in New Jersey and we filmed a 10 minute. My husband did the video. It was the video, uh, did the video stuff. And then I we filmed a 10 minute version of Super Trainer, we called it, sent it off. And that's the video that sold it to Channel 4. Rest wow. is history. I, hundred and, how many episodes have I done now? 140, about to, to do another 10. So that'll be 150 episodes since 2005 so what i'm hearing from you there is that <clears throat> initially kind of acting was your passion but you found your purpose through dogs all right you hit the nail on the head absolutely that's powerful yeah and i think to then take that kind of leap to think right we've got to. <laughs> i think people have to remember the tv landscape at the time because the stuff that was on telly was pretty tough on dogs, actually. Uh, and um, uh, a lot of people, I see it when people try and reference back to early It's Me or the Dog episodes, they've got to remember when it was. And, 2005. Uh, exactly. And, um, you know, uh, and how at the core of what you were talking about was the ab advocacy for kind methods. That was really important, which in an... In a, uh, a kind of media environment where it was anything but actually and sadly it kind of hasn't shifted much in some ways as we know so this is a lot of pressure then isn't it because without you know when you think about doing this show you know, I want to get some better education out there I want to talk about things so we can help try and avoid less dogs going into these shelters and, and all this kind of thing you almost end up becoming the poster girl if you like for a different approach which we can forget how important that was, I think, culturally at the time with what was on the media, but also the huge pressure that that again throws at you, because now, of course, the media want to pitch you against other. And that brings a lot of challenges, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, and naively, I was naive. I just wanted to train dogs on TV. Then you got to make it entertaining. I understood that. You know, I did understand that. I wear black anyway. All right, I'll wear black. I don't care. I wear leather jackets. I used to be a punk. I don't know. So 
yeah, I wear I wear black nail varnish. That's just the, what I do. So I did it on TV because that's what I wore anyway. And um, and then they gave me a nice car to drive. Well, I'll drive that. Um, and then I just went and had fun. But I loved what I did. And I remember after the first episode, I was actually still shooting here in England when the first episode actually aired on Channel 4 to, I think, I don't know, having like 5 million viewers at the time um, on that first episode and it just exploded. But um, but the papers the next day, I was like, I was suddenly like, what are they doing talking about my clothes? Don't they like what I actually did with the dogs? I mean, come on, naive, really, seriously. Because I didn't look like Barbara Woodhouse. I wasn't a bloke either. I was somebody that wore black, drove a fancy car, you know, and 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 so everybody was like, mm. and then the rumor started, because of course you can't have a female, a young female doing this. She must just have been plucked, plucked by Channel Four because she's an actor. They they just took her and employed her to do this show, because God forbid a young woman could come up with an idea and actually make it work. So all of these rumors started coming out. I'm like, wait a second, this is my idea. It's me, nobody from Channel, I was the one who made the video and sent it off to Ricochet Productions and to Channel 4. Nobody found me anywhere. I got this. And I have to say right from the beginning, that has still not left me. People will still say, Oh, you know, I mean, even a quote that that happened from from a trainer that's relatively well known when the social media thing about me exploded, which was nobody came to me up first to ask about it. But but um, was like, well, if I wore black and leather boots and blah, blah, maybe I'd have a TV show. Even now, even from a female. And so. You, you get you develop thick skin very very hard you learn very fast sorry you develop thick skin very hard thick skin and you also learn very fast that actually how naive you were are and that not everyone's gonna like it because the other thing about it Andrew was that um I was I was not like the not just looking different, but I was also diff doing different techniques on television that I think threatened a lot of the old style trainers that have been doing it for years and years in a certain way. And I was saying, no, that's not going to fly anymore. We're doing things in a different way now. And I still, when I started, was still very much into pack theory. I just was like, you don't physically ever hurt a dog, but I still used sound aversion pots and pans and making noises and the ah uh, ah, uh, which when I hear people do now, I cringe. Um, so, but I've evolved and I think any trainer worth their salt should evolve. And we continue to evolve to where we are now, Andy, which is like where we're still evolving, aren't we? Because your journey too. Yeah. Oh God, you know, I think of some of the dogs I only saw last year and I wish I could see them now. Yep. And that will be the same next year and next year if we keep moving forwards. I just want to thank you so much for being so vulnerable there because I think it's important. And this is, um, uh, I said to you off air, I'm so glad I didn't have TV cameras following me around 10 years ago. I think mm -hmm. people forget about what it is when you do put yourself out there on whatever level actually, and this will bring us a nice segue into um, a little topic I want to talk about in a mo, but <clears throat> uh, I see people who want to do, who see that maybe they 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 uh, kind of merit themselves on success based upon how big a profile they might have, how big a platform, maybe getting on the telly. And I think there is a little note here to be careful what you wish for, yeah. because there's a lot of stuff that comes with it. And I think um, you know you've weathered so much over the over those years and you're still here and you're still advocating i know because we talk privately 
probably 90% of what you do is off screen, mm -hmm. behind the scenes, never talked about good, solid advocacy work for dogs and dog welfare. And you have evolved over the years and you've always been um, uh, very honest about that if people have been prepared to listen. But I think there's a bigger topic here, which I think many will relate to in listening in the, uh, uh, in the chat here. Whether it's the press media, whether it's um, other well-known professionals, or that troll online, the other side of the world that you've never met, right? When you put yourself out there and are and become and, and be vulnerable and say, look, this is what I'm going to offer to everybody. We have as soon as we do that, we have to recognize that there will be a portion who won't get it, who won't like it, and who will come for us on it. And even though we develop that, that thick skin, as you talk about, which is when we think, when we feel that the purpose is greater than the negative, we keep going. But it doesn't mean we don't get upset by it. And I think that's really important. And interesting, I was talking to somebody recently doing a kind of a support thing. And because I have friends in the industry who do have big profiles, this notion that somehow the bigger that profile gets, the less likely you are to have burnout, compassion, fatigue, imposter syndrome. It's the opposite, right? Mm. Because of all that stuff you have to navigate. But you don't have to be a big celebrity or a well-known person to still struggle to navigate on social media. This is heartbreaking. I'm going to share it with you now. I had a lady contact me uh, recently to ask if I could look over an article that she was going to put onto her Facebook. And I looked at her and thought, oh, this is great. Yeah, you should totally put this up and I'll share it in my group. Then she shared with me the reason she asked me was because five years ago, five years ago she put something on social media and the negative comments she had she had loads of positive but the negative comments she had the very unkind comments they weren't constructive was enough to stop her from posting for five years victoria now you and i have both experienced our fair share of misrepresentation trolling on, on various levels and degrees but it still makes it hard to navigate it does and um, the first thing I think is really important is for anybody listening, you know, you put anything out there on YouTube, you put it on your TikTok page, you know that you're going to get comments and some of those comments are going to be great and others are not going to be great. And you'll remember the not so great ones, you'll forget the great ones, but you should not be defined by the comments that anybody makes. You should be defined by how you feel and by the success that you are seeing in yourself in whatever you're doing, however large or small that is in your community, in your uh, town in your city, your country, your, in the world, it doesn't matter, right? You define success by how you feel and how you're making those dogs feel and those people feel. That's really, really important. That is what drives me. Um, it doesn't mean to say that I don't get hurt and something that I recently experienced on social media, I had no idea, <laughs> call me again, stupid and naive, but um, I had done a certain protocol, which I had no idea was part of a protocol on my one of my latest shows. And um, and uh, somebody contacted the trainer whose protocol it was. No, it's like it's kind of conditioning anyway. But um, and this person, this trainer released it. Released it and the wolves pounced. I had no idea because I'm really not. And apart from your page, I really don't i'm not on that on facebook pages like that because i just find it quite destructive sometimes and so um but we couldn't ignore it and it was um and i think what hurt me most is that well-known trainers that know me some students that know me some people that know me got on there and it was like a pack of wolves descending i was utterly shocked now i only read a few comments because i couldn't cope with any more but the team had to and so um, I was shocked by the level of just vitriol and the fact that instead of coming to me to ask about that certain protocol, that wasn't done. The person in question went straight out and let the masses know and then fed those, fueled the flames and people jumped on like it was it was shocking. And that shook me to my very core because I was like, A, I'm innocent. Call me dumb, but I'm innocent. And B, nobody bothered to ask me to come to me. 
and all those people jumped on the bandwagon, they don't know me. But I was guilty and what a horror I was and the whole thing. And so I'm used to this, right? I've weathered these storms time and time again from the way I look to the way I train to the way I do this, the way I do that, to, you know, the shop color trainers or the this. Get, I've weathered that. But this was from people in the positive community. And that, again, highlighted to me really, it just, it shook my faith in the positive community to its very core because I was like, guys, come on. Really? You are going to spout being positive trainers towards not just dogs and people. I mean, people are know that it's people as well. Yet, you did this without even doing your research, without even coming to me first. You just, you just hung, drawn and courted me without, without seeing if I was guilty. Mm. That is social media. Now, when I first started Smeal the Dog, there wasn't social media like that. There was email websites but not social media so um but now the social media it is is so fabulous for in many ways because it allows us to get our message across and it's so damaging in others so so yes even with all my experience that shook me to my very core because I was like there are still people out there for whatever reason that want to jump on me and tear me to shreds what have I done to deserve that oh truly do people hate me that much I just I was shocked and then I was like because I think I'm quite a nice person yeah I've been outspoken I haven't always done things right definitely I've evolved as a trainer from 2005 but I'm actually quite a nice person and I am very giving always talk about people's ideas always talk about always want to throw light on anybody that's deserving of light you know it really it makes me very sad hearing you frame it in, in that way because um you know uh this is the thing it does hurt and I think People can say such flippant yet hurtful things and presume that the person they're writing about won't read it. <laughs> but, yeah, we do. And I've, I've, I've had my own uh, experiences along these terms as well. And, uh, and uh, you know, um, uh, I, I say often perception is everything. You know, for every person out there that knows us, there is a different version of us. And actually, if we try and fulfill the expectations of those who put us on these high pedestals, we never can. No. And equally, even if we wanted to try and change ourselves based on the negative judgments of others, we never will. But you know what? We can easily fall into that trap of trying to do all that. And it becomes very hard. What I can reassure you is, you know, there is always a very vocal minority um and uh you know we've got to try and protect ourselves as best we can from you know there's, there's a saying hurt people hurt people and I think there's something in that sometimes and a lot of the filters we have you know when we met for the charter for example you know and getting people around the table in a real room that was my vision because I thought if we do this via email or zoom it's not going to feel the same because it's not especially when you're behind a keyboard some of those filters that are there where you think hang on I need to read the room here uh, and maybe an but that seems to go out the window sometimes in a lot of these kind of threads. And um, I saw some of it myself, Victoria, and I thought this is just not right. And actually, the the main issue was resolved well in the end, and that's how it should be. But this is a bigger picture thing, I think, and we have to, as an industry, as a community, start thinking more about how we navigate this more. For these young trainers coming in, many are by the very nature of how they come into the community, they're quite vulnerable already because they're kind of blinking into the into the sunlight of all this stuff. What, did, what must it say to them? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, God bless you all is all I'm saying and get ready. Um, but, but here's the big but. It's very easy to get. And I, and I, for a couple of days, I was just broken, truly broken. I don't get broken easily. 
Um, and I think if I didn't have as good a support system as I do around me, my husband and the whole team, my positively team, um, I wouldn't have been able to have got myself out as fast as I could. And I realized, you know, that there's a reason why people say they can't take it anymore. Mm. Why social media can be so, so damaging. But after that couple of days of sort of, you know, going, poor me, poor me, I was like, and you know what? Screw y'all, as we say, y'all down in the South in Atlanta. Um, think what you think. Because I got some dogs to train and I got some students that are taken, you know, at VSA and they're loving their courses and we built amazing things and working on amazing courses for positively.com for dog lovers. I've got a new TV show coming out. Um, and again, I had to tell the trainers because there's six trainers it's called the Dog Academy. And I think it airs March the 30th, starts first transmissions March the 30th on Channel 4. Um, but I'm I'm like, guys, you've got to, because I'm the uh, consultant for it as well as one of the trainers in it. And, you know, we did a big search for trainers and um, and I was like, get ready. Get ready, because these guys have not been on tv before one has but um one has but the others have not and i'm like and they're so like gung-ho and they're so brilliant at what they do and so like for the dogs and for the people and has like just get ready know that this will happen but there's so much good to come out of it and so i'm excited for it and i'm excited for them but as i said TikTok, right? There are some trainers. I've just got into TikTok. It's me or the dog went on TikTok and I don't do that page, but I've now really got into TikTok. I just love it for other stuff, for comedians mostly that make me laugh. And um, But there's lots of great dog trainers. There's lots of terrible dog trainers on there, but lots of great dog trainers on there. And um, so, you know, they're, they're educating people brilliant, and they're going to be, you know, some bad comments. But they're doing fabulous stuff. So I really don't want those naysayers to stop us from doing what we love and for putting that message out there. So for every naysayer, there's going to be 10 people that are like, yeah. Or they're going to be people that are like, you saved my life with my dog. You literally saved our relationship. You, you, you made me see things in a completely different way. Thank you. You've got to think about those people, not, not what we call them. The, we call them the armchair rescuers. <laughs> but they sit and they're on their way, typing on their, their keyboard. When the people are out there doing the rescue work, right? And then they're getting bad comments from the people that aren't, but they're still commenting. Forget those. You do yeah. your work. And that's why I think it's important that we protect our... Uh, kind of a healthy self-esteem which is you know you can not like what I write you can not you can have a perception of me as a person but that doesn't make it true <clears throat> and um and I think we always have to presume that uh a well-known uh trainers when I when I put out my phantom of the opera piece which got me a, a lot of attention yes it positive, did. <laughs> but also not so good sometimes and, yeah. and again you read stuff when people are saying he's saying that he's like this and he's that I think I am reading it and um, and it's not, but there you go. But uh, they said to me, you know, there's always three types of people. There are the people that get it. So you're kind of preaching to the choir there, right? And that's all very nice. And actually you shouldn't seek validation from them necessarily because you'll get very disappointed if you don't get it from them. You get those who, doesn't matter what you write, you could smile at them and they think you're laughing at them. You know, you'll never get them to think about it. And they're just not worth thinking about. And you just got to let that reflect off you. It's that big bulk in the middle that, like you said, that one person where they might think, I get it now. Or actually, that's made me feel about something. Yes. And really, we're storytellers, I think. We're, we're here to try and light the little flame of inspiration in another. And even if nothing else, we're a better mom and dad to our own dogs. It makes it all worthwhile, right? Yeah. I think so. So choose where you seek your validation. I think that's the key. Absolutely. And you know, it's me or the dog is a story arc. Every single episode is a story, right? We go and it's all the same, right? But, um, and you know, it's me or the dog finished in 2013, but then they brought it back 
after the pandemic. So that's why we filmed 30 new episodes and I'm about to film another 10. But every, it's a story about a family and a dog that there's something that's just not going right. And I come in and help them. That's all it is. Mm. But through that, it's human journeys. It's canine journeys. And so for me, that's what it is all about. It's about telling a story and it's about helping people and animals in conflict. I love that because when you think about what our job is, this is why it's hard. We are turning up to the distress of others often, you know, often the human as well as the dog. And that's a big thing to do. And um, uh, also the opportunity through the medium of television to have a positive, kind message has never been more important. Now you'd think by now, every other TV show would be a, a version of It's Me or the Dog. But we haven't, Victoria. So let's just think about this in a more general way. There's been quite a big, you know, there's been a lot of hoo ha on social media one way or another recently. And, and, and one big thing is about whether there are any bridges that we can build with those who use aversives and whether there's learning to be done both ways and stuff. And uh, my, my personal view is that uh, I think we should always have an open door for those who want to learn more and move. But I think there is a time now that we should be drawing a line in the sand very clearly, really, because, uh, but I did feel a year or two ago that the dial was really shifting in our favor. But with the advent of some of these other TV shows, especially here in the UK, uh, some of the big names on TikTok, especially here in the UK and uh, on Instagram, what's your kind of finger in the air on things at the moment? Well, Do you I feel think, battle, um, battles are won or are we still really... You know, um, I really think things have changed for much for the better since 2005. Um, things have changed much the better in the positive camp. There are more um, people doing it in the right way than there ever have been before. I think the the even though it seems like other TV shows, you know, but but I really think from when I first started, though all those years ago, it's definitely the balance is shifting. Even though sometimes you might not think it has definitely got so much better than it was. So that's a good thing. But television is very seductive, very seductive, because wow, look what you can do in 30 minutes. And this is another thing I learned. Wait a second. When I watched the first series, I was like, oh, that's so edited. I mean, everything that I did, we did so much stuff. And they can't show 56 hours of footage that we took over four days because nobody's going to watch that. They have to edit that 56 footage, 56 hours of footage down to 42 minutes when it was an hour. Wow. And now I only have one and a half days with people. But that's still a good eight hours of footage that has to be edited down to 22 minutes because you've got you've got the advertisements as well. So um, when you think about it, like, but editing has to be truthful. So, um, but television is very seductive because look what you can do. Or, you know, you can go into a home with a dog, um, I don't know, charging another dog's um, on the lead, lunging at the other end of the lead. And you know what you can do? You can get that other lead and you can go, bam. And the dog's going to stop. Boom, amazing. And so another trainer that's in my country, we started at the same time. I started on Animal Planet. This trainer started on National uh, Geographic. So, um, uh, sorry, I started on Channel 4 here, but it went over to Animal Planet in the US. So I didn't know who he was. And we were both, our shows was, were growing at the same time. And um, I remember my husband buying me a DVD of this trainer in the US and I was like oh there's this new trainer in the US and um I bought me this DVD so we watched this DVD and I was like oh no and that's when you know we were making in the United States as well as well as here in the UK strike it was trending upwards and that when it slumped so I had to be outspoken and um I think kind of being more I think as the older I've got the more um, less reactive. I'm a less reactive uh, canine now. And um, 
And I, I think more, my impulse control is better. I will still fail at times. We all do, we're not perfect. But um, so I would sort of be outspoken about those. And, but now I'm just focusing. I focus on what I do. And um, regardless of what other people do, I have to just focus what I do. Because what I realized I was focusing so much on what you shouldn't do that I was talking less about what you should do. Mm. So I want to just focus on what you should do. And it's unfortunate, but let me tell you from the television's perspective, the television producer is only seeing that. And mm. I have to say, wrestling a dog to the ground or, you know, doing a nice leash jerk or whatever is much sexier than clicker training. Mm. and it sells and because you see such a great result the dog's not food guarding anymore but you watch with the sound off and you see that that dog is in the corner like that that dog yeah. shut down and i always tell people you know what that training works yes it does yes it does because the dog will stop doing the behavior but it's suppressed it's not changed that's mm. the difference and so that's how i explain it you can train like that absolutely you absolutely can because it works to a certain point but i'd rather my dog do something with me i don't say for me i say with me because it wants to not because it fears what's going to happen to it if it doesn't yeah and it's that thing, that difference between task versus care that I talked about at the first conference, actually. <clears throat> and it's that task at all costs that you see at all, you know. And I think this is something, again, we should celebrate. We'll come off the TV show in a moment. We've spoken before about the TV and, um, you know, I've had opportunities to do stuff and very kindly have, have offered things there. And I've I've kind of shifted away from it mainly because of, um, you know, I haven't got the face for TV, really. No, you haven't, <laughs> and I keep on trying, but... But, but the thing is there, I now. think um, it takes a special person. I think that's definitely you and, and the other amazing people you've got for this new series coming up, I know. It's easy to criticise TV, but it's a certain beast, I think. And, and you've shared that with me before and the compromises we have to make. And you have to think, right, you know what? To get airtime, to get a message, you have to kind of, you have to bargain with the devil sometimes on some of this stuff. And that's just the nature of it. And yeah. we all have a perfect vision in our head about what a TV show might look like. Would anybody promote it and would anybody market it and would anybody buy no. advertisement to go in it? This is the reality of it. So I think we have to celebrate the fact that a more humane and caring approach is on the screen. And I think also... But it is. I have to say, and I just, hmm. if you don't mind me interrupting you there, because I do have to say, with Ricochet Productions, my producers, um, for It's Me or the Dog, are fabulous. And they want to make sure that everything is correct and that the animals are taken care of first and foremost. So I, um, even though there's other production companies with other trainers that are doing, I just want to make sure that, you know, mm. Ricochet Productions are fabulous. And also this new production company I'm working with that has done the Channel 4 show, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. They care. They care. It's the commissioners of the TV channels they're the ones that are going more like that but also right? you've brought a culture to those production companies as well because you know they don't very really know much about dogs or dog training or what wrong so i think it's a it's a it's a definitely a very successful collaboration i think and, and we have to celebrate that and say so this uh so um when we think about this then i think what uh dog center care specifically is about beyond the opera you know the the more and I think what people might not know is that you've recognized that really early on. So your VSA, your Victoria Stillwell Academy, which is about bringing forward the next generational stuff, mm. way before Dog Centre Care or any of this kind of things, you were asking people like Sarah Fisher to come along and others, to, and Sarah Heath, to talk about the more. And I know it's an important part for you because dog training is important, you know, the actual teaching, how we, how do we teach, but also recognizing all the other component parts for that animal and the need for relief and all these kind of things are really important. Uh, and that must have been a big step 
to think, do you know, I'm going to set up something to think about supporting others. And this is what you referenced earlier. It's again, it's a part of what you do that many people don't recognize, maybe because because you don't necessarily shout about it, which is because of because of, of who you are as a person. But the things that you do behind the scenes to support others, mm -hmm. even for myself, you know, we did a thing during lockdown to, to support my local rescue, did a yapathon. Yeah. As you know, I, I struggle to Great. talk much. You know, I'm quite shy. Uh, not. Uh, but anyway, so eight hours. And I, I asked you and you were there. Like, no. Oh, I don't know. Tight schedule. Sorry. It was like, yeah, I'll, I, if I can do it, I can do it. Uh, and you kind of brought that energy to the VSA. Really. It's like, how do I create a gold standard? Deep and broad education for the next generation. What was the real catalyst there for you thinking about bringing that forward? I wanted to be I wanted people to have what I didn't have in the terms mm -hmm. of if you want to be a good jobbing dog trainer and I should say and behave and, and behaviorist because um I I don't think you could sorry but I know I might try to, I, I don't think you can train dogs without having a really deep understanding of behavior and deal with behavior so i know that certainly with charter stuff and things it's really difficult to define are you just a dog trainer or are you a behaviorist or whatever no we're all dealing with behavior there are some people that actually focus more on the behavioral side of things there are people that focus more on the obedience side of things um i don't like that word obedience but there are some great trainers that are doing obedience work but i know that one of the reasons why uh, uh, andy that i wanted you to speak is because i know after the conversations that we had it was like Yes, because I had the same thing where I would go to classes and watch classes and just go, and you know, and, and even in me, I, I used to be like, do 10 reps of a sit, do this, make the dog do that. And and then I realized um when I would be watching these dogs, I'd be like, This is a, these dogs are learning great things. The trainer's really kind and but I don't think these dogs are having a good time. I don't think they're enjoying it. I think some of them are exhausted having to sit so much. Um, and then really, apart from, I have a, a friend, um, Jennifer, and she uh, runs a, an assistance dog organization in Georgia. And um, she's written a number of books. And they have probably some of the greatest assistance dogs in the United States that you can get because um, and they there it's a breeding program as well um, they never charge for any of their dogs recipients never pay a penny not in not to get the dog trained I mean sorry not to like you have to pay 25,000 no nope, not a penny nor for food ever for the rest of the dog's life nor vet care canine assistance does everything so um, Jennifer Arnold she they'd gone through, you know, they used to be Yank and Crank and they used to do, and then they just evolved to, and I remember that graduation is the day. So once the, the dogs at around 18 months to two years get paired up with recipients, and these can be anybody from people with muscular dystrophy to uh, people with diabetic, and we have seizure alert dogs, the whole thing. Um, and um when they got to graduation day, after pairing, they have about two weeks of working together before they take their dogs home. A graduation ceremony, and during those two weeks, these dogs were getting diarrhea. Well, they knew 75, you know, they were said these are the smartest dogs you could ever have. They knew so much, and they're so clever. And that's when the light bulb went off for Jennifer. She was like, because it was task orientated. Then they switched. It's not perfect, but they switched. The dogs, the way they raised these dogs, the way they taught these dogs was much more understanding the dogs from the dog's point of view, not putting too much on them, more dogs working out for themselves with some gentle guidance, more just kind of organic is a weird word to use, but it was. These dogs maybe know four cues, yet they know when that person with muscular dystrophy needs them to pick something up or needs a head or, or that our dogs that go into hospitals need to put their head on somebody's. It just is. And then after Jennifer Arnold, then then I met, then we chatted and I was like, oh, wow, yes, he's got it. And, you know, I've heard Jennifer talk, actually, <clears throat> and I think what's really clear there 
uh, I've, I've only heard her talk in recent times, so not you know, as she's made the shift. <clears throat> the level of pastoral care for the dog as much as the human. And I think that's really important. And we need to think about that more with, with again, all the kind of assistance dog and service dog and working dog generally, really. You know, I'm talking at the uh, gun dog conference here in the UK in, and yeah. to put the case towards uh, recognizing, you know, you can't get more task than a gun dog working. But actually, even those who are interested in performance, you know, sports dogs, anything really, we've understood more about the importance of physicality, which is important, but actually emotionality is just as important. And uh, if we have that level of pastoral care, if we think about the animal's care and support needs, even if you're somebody who's very much into final task is important, you can get better performance this way by having an animal that's better, well, well regulated, emotionally resilient, uh, <clears throat> who wants to connect, who wants to work, but also has that time for their own needs as well. It makes sense. It does make sense. And, you know, and I think there's been such a the working dog. Pe uh, the world is very different from the companion dog world. And there's, there's, <coughs> I have a working dog, but actually they're all dogs. Right. And so yeah. and they need to be um, raised in the same way and they need to be treated in the same way. Um, and so I went on this journey and filmed and worked with for five years. Um, and then two years after we finished filming, with the Gwinnett County Sheriff's Canine Unit in Georgia. And so I basically, I went, uh, saw how these dogs were trained and I started working with them myself. We went on all the calls. So not only were was I there in the training, we were there in real life when these dogs had to work real life. And we didn't just do it, we did it for five years. So I've been on more car chases, police chases, whatever, you, and more tracking and, and, um, these dogs for many of these guys were very much you know you get your toolkit don't you you get your gun your baton you whatever you also get your dog it's just, just another tool but then the dogs weren't being that effective or they weren't being that obedient or there were problems or they were biting their handlers and so as I went on a journey into this world they used to call me Miss Click Treat right? Even though I don't really do clicker training, but that's what they used to call me. I brought them into my world and the worlds converged. And so they became, they understood their dogs more. And I understood their pressure they were under more. That in turn made me a bit more understanding of people who use aversives. Because I could understand like for these guys who have a perp that's running, and they need to, if that perp turns around and like this, their dog that they've just sent off to go bite has to stop on their cue. And, and these dogs are, I'm talking about drive. These dogs are on the top. They're the Ferraris, the Lamborghinis of the dog world. Um, but they're under pressure, these lads and these women from, from their departments. They have to get it right. And so that's why they're using the shot collars and the blah, blah, blahs because that's how they're taught to do it. When they saw that there was another way and their dogs were responsive, but now their dogs weren't biting and their dogs were happier. It's a totally different thing. So, you know, it, us positive trainers um, are sometimes just as guilty, but sometimes people forget what they have at the other end of their lead. This um, rich emotional lives that these incredible animals have. And we want to make them sit 10 times in a row because that's what you've got to do for your canine good citizens or you're this or you're that. Come on. Really? And that's interesting because one of the big things I, you know, when I, when I gave my talk, the first talk that I gave with you and, and talked about this notion of the opera merry-go-round that actually, if you're just looking at task, you're kind of on it with everybody and everything's on the table. That was the thing that some people got it some people got it and felt uncomfortable by it, but they got it. Other people really didn't. They felt very angry about it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's easy to forget that coercion can come through food and through positive training. Just because we can get a behavior doesn't mean that dog feels any safer or is no. getting relief. And why do you think that is so hard? Is it because many of us, and I would include myself, because we, I say we've all gone on, we all go on a journey of stuff and, and you have those light bulb moments and you you see more and you see more. Uh, I think we can get stuck in what I call the cul-de-sac of training. Like everybody's in the cul-de-sac and then 
every so often you look over and think, well, there's a way out, there's more, let's go see more. Is it because of the heavy indoctrination into learning theory that it can be hard to let go of that sometimes? Yes, it is. And don't you dare rattle a cage. And that, let me, change is not meant to be easy. It is not easy. And it's not easy to change how you've been doing things or how you feel inside about a certain thing. It's just not. But I want to tell you a story about what happened to me with It's Me or the Dog. After the first season, I got an email from a woman in Brighton. I don't even know what her name was. And she was like, can you really stop this pack leader shit? And I was like, but what do you mean? It's because, you know, again, I was a follower of Jan Fennell and all the things. And I thought, you know, and all of the, that's how I've been taught. I put stickers on the fridges, you know, you get dogs here and then you are underneath and blah, blah, blah. And then she introduced me to Patricia McConnell. And my light bulb went off and I went, oh my God, she's right. And I went on that journey and it was a freaking great journey. And as I went on that journey, then I discovered more trainers and more people. And I've never, ever said, I invented this, ever. I didn't. I didn't. I've made some things, created some things, made other things, you know. That we that we did just learning theory, right? That's again. And so I've changed. You can see from 2005. I mean, everything they put on YouTube, and it's you know, I don't control that, unfortunately. So, um, but now I'm working with them so that I can say, can we not put those shows out right now? Because or, or not because they're the old school we don't want that anymore we've got new stuff coming so um but I think it's hard to change and I have to say I really saw something and I hope Jordan doesn't mind me talking about him I don't think he will because I talk about it a lot Jordan Shelley who's a wonderful trainer yeah love she, love Jordan, yeah wonderful trainer I was one of the people that criticized him when he did his dog training on the one show with the Jack Russell and the food bowl. And I was like, and I was so incensed with another American trainer that I was like, please, let's not have another one of those. So I was one of those people joining the throng, the wolf pack saying, get him off. We don't want that anymore. It's dangerous. And then it was Beverly Cuddy from Dogs Today. Again, another, another person who doesn't like the status quo and has challenged it many, many a time, who reached out to Jordan. And it was Dr. Ian Dunbar who said, come to APDT, APDT conference in San Diego. Come and learn. And he did. And I was there. And I went up to him and I was like, hi, I'm Victoria Stilwell. I want to apologize to you. I think it's very courageous you came here. And we sat and chatted. And I've known Jordan ever since. So he changed. He changed and he went through hell. He had photographers because his story hit the Daily Mail. Now. He had photographers hiding in his bushes. Snapping. He was victimized. And um. But he realized and he changed. And that was hard for him. And he's a brilliant trainer. But I'm saying that sometimes it's really difficult to know that maybe you don't have all the answers. But you know what? Nobody has all the answers. And to just be open <clears throat> to changing or open to just doing things different. Because even though I know We've had discussions, haven't we, about we're so focused on changing behavior, aren't we? And even though that's kind of what we have to do, why do we always want to change things? Well, change isn't easy. Sometimes it's hard for us to change. So it's going to be really hard for the dogs to change. But what are we really talking about when we're saying we want to change behavior? We want to stop the dog from lunging. But 
And that's when you started to get me thinking about that word change, behavior, change. Like what is it we're exactly doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now tired. I'm, I don't know. I'm just going to be talking about anything. But I'm just saying no, it's not meant to be easy, right? Well, it's not. And I think one thing that I think you have shown, <clears throat> if we, we're coming up to the, well, we've come past the hour, so we're over. Um, <clears throat> one more thing I don't want to come on before we go. So uh, if you're happy just to hang around for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Extra bit. Yeah. But what, on that point, though, I see uh, people who grab an idea and they are so... They go in and in and in on that idea to the point at the exclusion of all else. And they, they hold that up as being the answer. This is the thing. And they go and do that thing for the next X amount of years, right? And they won't let go of that thing because like you say, change is hard. We also see where people want to claim that thing. I, I call it the golem effect. It's that kind of, it's mine, precious. It's mine. Nobody else can have it. Um, and there is nothing new under the sun. What is new? And what is unique is our own filter of it. We take a bit of this, we take a bit of that, and what the Victorianness, the Andiness, the the Bobness, the Lauraness, the whoever you areness, which is beautiful. So that's what happens a lot in our community. But you have shown, and we've heard your story so wonderfully tonight, Victoria, that you are not that, because you have evolved so much. And it was interesting when I when I um, uh, when you kind of took the took a bit of a punt on me and allowed me to speak at the conference how after that I got invited to speak at other places which has been great some of them I could do whatever I want which is great but I have to tell you there's a couple where they changed my title of my talk they um audited my slides and oh, now we can't we can't have that bit can't have that bit and that's interesting isn't it because they weren't ready to fully say yeah, yeah. share your bit and then let other people critique it but they edited it first and you yeah. didn't. And I think this is really powerful and important. And actually the behavior conference, which is coming up soon. So I'll make sure we share stuff in the group. Another great lineup of talkers. I'm just so privileged and honored to be asked to come and talk again. I can't wait for this one, Victoria, because it's my big passion at the moment, which is the notion of social and emotional safety and what that looks like, bringing in things like attachment theory and uh, you know, all these kind of things and security, all these kind of things are really important and I can't wait to talk about it. Uh, and uh, and I feel safe in your environment. This is the thing you and Van, uh, your husband, have been so supportive. And I just want to say publicly, thank you for that. Uh, and also, uh, you know, stepping up and finding middle ground with other well-known professionals through the charter process. I just wanted to finish on this, really, because, uh, you know, it's hard, right? It was a bit like herding cats in the, in the early days a little bit, but um, but you were really up for it. And you were like, yeah, I, I'm happy to kind of talk. So I remember, we won't name names, but I remember there was a moment when, uh, you know, after the, the uh, meeting, when you went up and spoke to another organizational head and had a chat. And I thought, yeah, that's what this is about, right? Yeah. It's about trying to get people talking and creating those spaces. And so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw that in really. But the charter process is really important here in, in the UK, I think. And I'm looking forward to seeing where Carolyn takes. And this is the thing about recognizing skill sets, because my job really was just to get people in a room. And I did that. Did um, there's bigger picture stuff that I know Carolyn is really good at. And you guys are just taking that to the next level. But uh this thing about evolving and allowing ourselves to stay humble, I think, really, and just to think, yeah, you know, the only emotional experience we can really validate for is our own. Uh, and, uh, you know, even in human behavioral sciences, we, we know a fraction of a percent of the reality of stuff, uh, let alone a dog. So we're all on a mission, really, to be the best we can be to be available to these wonderful animals. I don't know many people who could have done what you did by bringing organizations that are competitive with each other um, together to form the UK Dog Behavior and Training Charter, but you did it. And these people, these organizations are fabulous. And so meeting, I mean, I'd known quite a few of the sort of the, the, the founders of the organization anyway, but but VSA and VSPDT, because I've got my lovely VSPDT trainers, that that we're founding members of the UK Dog Behavior and Training Charter because of you. So um you brought that together, and that does take a certain type of person, because not everybody could have done that. And Carolyn, she's amazing. 
And so she does have skill sets that, you know, are keeping everything ticking along and, and, but, but I always encourage, you know, organizations to, to check out what the charter is all about. And for people who are looking for a trainer to come to the charter and actually and find a trainer there as well, because I think it's really important that we stick together and we grow our industry. Our industry does need to have oversight. It absolutely does, because anybody can set themselves up as a trainer. I spoke in Parliament about it three years ago, um, and we do have to. And I think this charter is extremely important. Um, but I'd also say, can I plug here that, yes, the Dog Behaviour Conference, you've got to come in here, Andy speak, and some uh, other amazing speakers, and it's April the 21st to the 23rd, and you can go to dogbehaviorconference.com to find out more information, but I'm there all three days, you don't have to be there all three days for seven, eight hours, um, but if you register, then after all the the presentations have gone out then you have access to those presentations for a year but it's a lovely kind of community feel it's all online so people from all over the world come and that's why i was very excited when you first spoke because it wasn't just touching people here in the uk it was touching people from all over the world and more and more people in different countries from dubai to singapore to australia to england to america are getting are, are moving towards doing things right and so the more professionals that there are out there the more the web grows and the more communities people and their dogs will benefit so i think if we bring this full circle it is regardless of what people say on the social media and what's out there on television we've all got to keep going because it's for the betterment at the end of the day for dogs, isn't it? And the people that love them. And that last bit there, people that love them, you know, I think um, many caregivers get stuck in task and they end up doing stuff that actually they feel uncomfortable with, but the, invariably the guy on the telly did it uh, or the guy on TikTok did it. But actually they deeply care. And when they get a window into care, they 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 see it and they get it. And I think... What I would say to other people, to the people listening as well, is I see stuff that people do. I don't particularly like what they're how they're doing it. It wouldn't be how I do it, for example. Uh, and I might not particularly like the way that they're putting the message across. But I always think to myself, is the message one of kindness and, hum and, and a humane approach to the dog ultimately? And if it is, then that's a good message. It and we have to forget mess. about the messenger sometimes and just think, OK, do you know, I can I can I can avoid you on social media. I don't have to look at it. I don't have to kind of like you as a person, but you're giving a good message. And I think that's what we have to try and celebrate as a community. It's the message that's important, ultimately. Um, and also uh, to, to understand that these these people, these dog lovers who are just trying to do their best, and going out and getting information sometimes it's the wrong information but you'll see in the dog academy when you watch that show um that you'll see the light bulbs go off when they finally yeah. realize what their dog's going through or what they're doing and it's no it's no shaming just facts no shaming yeah. at all it's supportive that's what we need to be supportive what a great way to a uh, great word to, to kind of finish on really and what a wonderful conversation Thank you, everybody. We had amazing numbers watching live, which is great because uh, you don't have to watch live nowadays, of course, with catch ups. So that was great. Some great comments as well. If you get a chance, have a look, Victoria. But um, uh, are you likely? Uh, VSBDT is going to be at Crafts, aren't they? There's going to be a yes, stand we're going to be at Crafts. Yeah. We're in uh, Hall Three, Stand Three Dash Two. We're going to be there cool. with VSPDTs and also um, some VSA grads. And uh, come along, say hello. I'm going to be there Friday and Saturday. Cool, so, me um, too. So I will come oh, and you track are. you down in the nicest way. Yes. I come, I come so, uh, yeah, do come and see us and say hi. And then um, positively.com, we've got some very big, big changes coming and some great courses. A lot of them are going to be free just to just to help. It's not to take over trainers at all. It's just to help. And, um, yeah, watch the shows, please. Well, 
Sorry, dogs barking. Husband's, husband's, <laughs> husband's just come in. Uh, yeah, check out the conference. I'll make sure I promote that in the group anyway. So that's, that's a thank given. You. And um, and thank you so much for your time and sending love to you and, and mom and family. And uh, thank you. and I'll see you at Crofts hopefully. Yeah, and I can't wait for you to can't, can't wait for you to speak, Andrew. I'm really looking forward yeah. to it. You know, it's really funny because the first one. I, I can share this because this is the point. It doesn't matter how much you do stuff, you get nervous. And I was an absolute nervous wreck. My poor husband, that first two weeks, uh, and I even had to re-record it. I got, I got, I got, I got it's, it does get you, but it was such a big opportunity. But I feel now that um, I'm settling into the into the wow. kind of positively family now. So I, I feel very, very wow. much. I'm really looking forward to. It. Well, thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, join us tomorrow. We've got the wonderful Sindor. Sindor Pangal tomorrow at one o'clock. So it's one o'clock because we're matching it with India time uh, with a great question, actually, Victoria, which is what do dogs know? What an interesting and profound question that is. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, good night. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit subscribe. So I'm getting quite good at this now. I'm almost a professional. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thanks, everybody. Night. Bye.